firms like ours need to have the technology. They need to have things in place that a younger generation of a client can get involved. They can get on a mobile app at two in the morning and see their account. Things that that generation wants, I think, are really important. There's going to be shifts in the industry, but if your firm is not willing to invest in the people, the technology, the compliance, and the marketing, you're going to have trouble capturing some of those things. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Connected Advisor. I'm your host, Kyle Van Pelt, co-founder and CEO of MileMarker. And today I am joined by Brett Bernstein. Brett is the co-founder and CEO of XML Wealth Management, a fast-growing firm out of Bethesda, Maryland, with a, real, a bunch of really cool stories that I'm excited to get into. Uh, Brett also does a bunch of other stuff outside of the wealth management industry. He served on various nonprofit boards and things like an organization called So What Else, which is a, a grassroots charity helping at-risk youth, which you guys all know I'm going to want to get into a little bit here to find out about the person behind the wealth management industry. So Brett, thanks so much for being on the podcast with us today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So uh, first, we were talking about this off air. Before I start getting into my questions, for all of those who can't see on the video, Brett's got this huge sneaker behind his head, uh, which belonged to uh, an NBA player. So Brett, just let's cold open this thing with the story about who that sneaker belonged to. Yeah, so my dad is a foot doctor, retired, and that's Minute Bowl's sneaker. Um, he was a patient of his, he treated him. So it's an autographed sneaker and, you know, just kind of cool to have. It's been around forever. So anyone who was a, a NBA fan and, and he did make a little run through the, at the time it was the Washington Bullets, now it's the Wizards. So, uh, yeah, it's part of my many different memorabilia and tchotchkes and things I have behind me. Man, that's so cool. And, and for the uninitiated, Manute Bull was how tall? I think he was seven foot seven. Seven foot seven. Uh -huh. That is a very tall human being. So I can only imagine his his uh, his shoe is, you know, not not the same average size as mine, yeah. probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool, man. Um, I always love hearing about those kinds of background things. So speaking of background, one of the questions I love to open these podcast interviews with is a question we call, what is your money moment? Um, and to frame it up for you, I have found in lots of discussions with people through my time in the industry that everybody has a different path that took them to working in this space. Some people maybe grew up in it, other people stumbled upon it. But what I have found is that everybody kind of has this moment in life that we call their money moment that was like, oh, this is what I want to dedicate my career to. Something happened, could be good, could be bad. But Brett, would love to, to hear from you. What was your money moment that made you really want to do this as a career? Yeah, great question. As I mentioned, my dad's a retired uh, foot doctor and I was set to go to college and go pre-med. I had said, oh, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to, I'd taken all these classes. I was going to go to college, go to medical school, partner with my father. And then he explained to me what managed care was. You know, here I am a high school kid going, oh my God. So, you know, they're going to tell me what I can make and, and all these things. And all that seems dumb. And he said, well, why do you want to be a doctor? I said, well, I want to help people. And he's like, well, you want to make all this money. You're going to have rules and regulations, most likely in whatever you do, right? Whether it's healthcare or finance. Why don't you go intern with my stockbroker, right? It was a stockbroker. Okay. So I did that and I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating. And I changed, I pivoted. I went to the University of Maryland, went to the Robert H. School, uh, Smith School of Business, finance, right? Major. And I interned all through college with the stockbroker, if you will. And so I learned a lot. Interestingly, that firm was one of the underwriters for Steve Madden. So we kind of lived through that, that whole debacle. So watching Wolf of Wall Street was kind of interesting, but I didn't know at the time, but that was the money moment where I said, you know, I want to help people. Do I want to have, you know, four years of college, four years of medical school, plus residencies. I wouldn't have seen a real income earning years until I was in my thirties, or I could come out intern all through college and hit the ground running. And that's what I did. And I never looked back. That's really cool. It's a funny, funny call back to Wolf of Wall Street, because literally that's the first thing I thought when you said I was with the the firm that did the the Steve Madden IPO and the yeah. debacle. I was like, that sounds like a, this uh -huh. sounds like a movie. That's hilarious. So one thing I've actually heard often used as an analogy in financial planning or financial advice is that you are like 
a doctor for people's money. And so when I hear you talk about it, you were thinking about going to medical school, your, your father was in the medical field. Um, does any of that resonate for you? Were you able to kind of take a same sort of approach with how you work with clients and how your firm works with clients? Yeah, great question. I do. I have a joke I've used since the day I started. I'm a certified financial planner. I believe in holistic financial planning. Every time I sit down with a client, I say, I'm going to do a history and physical. You're just going to keep your clothes on for mine. And <laughs> that's the response I usually get. People <laughs> chuckle, but it's true, right? I mean, because I like to use imagery that people can relate to. And that's exactly what I'm going to do, right? Some say I'm going to do a financial colonoscopy, pick the term you want to use. But yes, I have always taken that approach because I need to know what you own and what you owe and where you are and where you're trying to get to. And I, I use analogies like that. And so if a, uh, I say to a client, when we go through, let's say their portfolio, when you go to your doctor and you're having surgery, do you ask what scalpel size they're using and what suture or what's the procedure? What's my recovery? I can get as granular as you want with the mutual fund or the index fund or whatever investment vehicle we're using. Or let's talk about the holistic planning approach. They can recognize, you know, the example that I gave with a history and physical, what your clothes are on. And so I've always taken that approach. And I think collectively as a firm, that's just the philosophy that we go by. Uh, that's incredible. And it seems to have worked. Um, I know that you all have grown quite a bit over the past couple of years. Yeah. Kind of open-ended question, but everybody wants to be growing. There's a lot of what uh, the industry calls inorganic growth, right? Acquiring firms, pulling them in, especially in the low interest rate environment we had over the past couple of years. But what do you think has been the greatest attribution to XML growing as much as it has over the past couple of years? You know, me particularly as, as the leader of the firm, I bring something unique. I started my career at Merrill. That's the XML, jokingly stands for X Merrill Lynch. We don't trade as that, but that is kind of where it came from. It, the Roman numerals, right? It's like a Super Bowl. It's powerful. I joked that being at a big bank, wirehouse or brokerage firm is like being in prison. I then left and went to LPL and it was a great experience there as well. I look at that as the halfway house. And then I took off my ankle bracelet and we became an RIA in 2016. And so I feel a unique experience I bring is that I've seen all three facets of the industry. And I think that's very helpful that when we are looking to grow, my original founding partner, Rob Canner and I in 2016 decided that it was time to leave LPL, not because of anything they did. It was a great relationship. But did we want to become an RIA and be a lifestyle business? And trust me, there's days I wish it was just five of us. Or did we want to turbocharge our growth? And we did. I'm a focused financial partner firm. I'm a partner. I've been with them since 2016. The reason I went there is not that I was looking to take money off the table or do anything like that, but we wanted to turbocharge our growth. And in my opinion, they are the best in the industry. The way they were each independently run and operated is still unique because many firms don't run that way. And so we had a fork in the road. And we decided to go down the path of allowing us to turbocharge our growth. And if I wanted to have growth, I needed to have a partner behind me, not just with the financial backing, but with the M&A experience. But as a leader, I also needed to bring something to the table that I think people could resonate with. So when you're talking about the inorganic growth, people could, they couldn't come and say, well, Brett, you don't understand. You haven't been there. Well, no, I still actively do manage clients. I do understand because I was at Merrill. I do understand because I was at an IBD with LPL. And I do understand because I went RIA. So I think that combination um, has really led us to have this turbocharged growth. That is insightful. And I appreciate you sharing that. And so for some reason, my mind goes to this place. I, I think about advisors are capital allocators for their clients and great business owners are capital allocators for their business. So if you go to some place like Focus, I do think most of the time people believe that's uh, where people are taking money off the table, right? They're, they're trying to de-risk it or they're trying to take money off. But when you say, hey, that wasn't really the goal, it was about turbocharging growth. I'd love to hear a little bit about how you thought about allocating capital, right? When you get this war chest, right? Is it for trying to acquire books? Is it for hiring headcount? Because, hey, the, the way we're going to have to grow is through headcount. Is it technology investment? Like, how did you think about allocating uh, the fuel that you got, you yeah. know, to turbocharge that growth as you took it on. Yeah, look, at the end of the day, it is focuses capital, right? So they have the say in how to allocate it. But with us, we had done a small merger before focus and it was a successful one, except it's not very tax efficient, right? You're borrowing money from a bank. You are paying it back out of the cash flow. You're paying phantom income on it. So it's great that it was covered, but I wasn't seeing any of the benefits yet. I'm doing all the work. 
And so, you know, there's a difference in taking that approach, which is more the lifestyle way versus having, you know, a real investment, you know, backer. And look, at the end of the day, there's different reasons you, you know, look at M&A activity, in my opinion, right? One is some firms need a succession plan. That is important. Others, people want to turbocharge their growth, but don't have the entrepreneurial spirit, don't have the backing or don't have the desire to do it on their own. So if they can plug into something that's already set up, right, having the technology stack, the marketing stack, the operational team, well, could they get to where they want to get to faster? Could it also be a succession plan? So that is something that we as the operator and focus, my private equity partner, look at, again, I'm speaking in terms of with XML, not with the partnership as a whole, is looking at it saying, is this a good use of their capital? Does this firm or person or team fit with what we're doing? And is it going to lead to more growth? Because at the end of the day, we still are managing clients' wealth. We still have to always put the client's best interest first. We always have to treat them right. And so what I found is it's not about the deal. It's always about the people. We've walked away from more deals that look great. These are not people that you want to work with. Their client base may not fit with what we're trying to do. So you have to look at the totality, no different than a holistic financial plan we do with the client. You have to do the same thing when you're bringing a team on. And I think that's the approach that we take and focus takes when looking at how you hire someone or do an inorganic merger strategy. So that also makes me think about a lot of the conversations I have with folks like yourself is it feels like there is a, a kind of a seesaw or a yin and yang between technology investment and headcount investment. And it also seems like a lot of firms are trying to figure out how to decouple those things because in a lot of ways, it seems like you know revenue and headcount growth kind of are going up at the same clip and they're trying to use technology to maybe break that a little bit. But curious to hear about in XML, right? What, what does that look like for you know technology investment versus headcount investment to support the growth of your business? Yeah, I mean, technology investment's huge. I mean, last year we made a, a significant investment and hired a chief technology officer. Okay. She has been an amazing addition to the firm. And um, she's having me spend a lot more money, but, <laughs> but, but in a good way. We've always put technology and cybersecurity at the forefront, a very robust, secure system. One of very few firms that actually has our own, our own mobile app, not a portal, not any money or Ryan portal. It's my own app. You know, look, look at Tesla as a car company. They're always putting software patches out there and different things. You can play holiday music right on your horn. In a free compression world, we have to be providing things to our clients. So whether that's something they see on the front end, we use eMoney. So whether that's rolling out a portal and planning software like eMoney for the client to have a better experience, it doesn't come at a cost to the client, it comes at a cost to me. But on the flip side, I'll give you an example. My CTO came to me and said, I want to bring this new compliance training software. I'm like, oh God, right? The one thing we never want to hear about. But she said, look, Brett, cybersecurity is so important and no one ever wants to look at the slides and listen to the video. And this is a company, it's not expensive, and it uses B-list actors to voice over these things like John Lovitz and all these people. And the hope is that you actually are interested. You're like, oh, who's the next actor going to be? And so instead of you clicking through the slide, you might spend the three minutes or five minutes because it's actually funny and interesting. So from the front end perspective that the client sees on the cybersecurity side, we have to keep investing in things to make our firm better. And so some of it is a direct result of hiring people, but some of it is also a direct result of just, we have to always be doing better, right? So our team is up with cybersecurity, understanding the things that we need to be doing. So there's just one example. Again, wasn't expensive. I kind of laughed, but when I saw the demo, I'm like, I'd watch that. That was yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. You guys hired a CTO, right? Which I think most people in the industry would look at that and say, that's for firms much bigger. What would we do with a CTO? We probably don't have 40 hours worth of work per week for a CTO, things like that. Could you just maybe lay out for the audience kind of what mandate your CTO has and, and kind of how they're providing value to the firm other than finding incredible compliance yeah. testing software and bringing it to you? Yeah. So I wasn't looking for one. This was someone who I had known. She was actually started as a client service associate and covered me when I was at Merrill. We kept in touch. She grew to be in very significant leadership roles um, at a $20 billion RIA. And she was ready for a change and just said, hey, do you happen to know anyone? It fell in my lap. But having said that, 
I would use this example the same as when I spoke at a, um, on a panel at uh, DeVoe Conference in Nashville last year on, on marketing growth. You have to commit resources. And we've all been there where we think we're too small or we don't have it, or we try little things here and there. And all of us try, and a lot of times they fail because things don't talk. And so you, know, you might go down the path in a minute on some of the marketing, but I look at technology the same way. At some point, we have to have a quarterback. You know, I look at myself when managing money that I'm the head coach. You own the team. I'm a, I'm a I always say Redskins, but I'm a Commanders fan. I've yep, always yep. said you're Dan Snyder. Thank God we don't say that anymore. <laughs> well, right, it's Josh your Harris, money. Baby. Right, right. It's our year. Um, but it's it's your the client. It's your money. My job is to be the head coach and the quarterback and help you do it. You need the same thing with operational things in your firm, whether it's on the marketing front or the technology and compliance, because I think they go all hand in hand. At some point, you can't be an advisor running the firm, also doing your compliance, handling your marketing, and handling this stuff. So I think that you can use outsource people, right? If you think you're too small to do that, at some point, it makes sense to have that person. So, so her mandate is to make us better. Now, she comes from a mindset that it's all about growth, which I like. Some people, compliance, technology, they just are putting these things in place where the advisors say, this is going to slow us down. And her mindset is, no, this is to make us better, grow faster, better client experiences. And so she's doing things from, look, no one's database is perfect, cleaning up the database, getting our CRM to integrate with other pieces of software that we use better. And in the, call it roughly six months she's been here, it is night and day what we've already seen. It is amazing. So in one respect, you can say, well, I don't have the hours or maybe the money to do it. I would say it the other way. You do have the hours. The question is, do you want to spend the money? And I think that you're going to get the value because if it's the right person with the right mindset, it will lead to growth, whether that's inorganic or organic. This podcast is brought to you by Turncast. We make game-changing content for fintech and financial services companies. Learn more at turncast.com. Excellent answer. I, I love that. And I love hearing the way that XML is thinking about technology investment and how you can use it to grow your firm um, and that you're, you know, you are allocating resources to mm -hmm. it, um, which I think is, is really interesting. And I, and I feel like I've seen that across the board with firms that are growing and, and, and firms that we look at is that they obviously headcount's always going to be a part of that, but they all seem to be in the top percentile of technology investment um, and understanding that that doesn't necessarily pay dividends right away, but it compounds just like everything else, right? The, the, the more that you invest in that efficiency and integration and technology, it can really pay off for your firm in the long run. I think that's great. I would love to shift a little bit to uh, what I call get out your crystal ball moment. So much is happening in the industry. It has been happening for years. Obviously, there's lots of fever pitch conversations around things like AI and still even crypto in a lot of ways, right? We got a crypto ETF that just came out. We've got all these different things. And those are the hot button issues. There's also things that might not be as hot button. But Brett, I want you to get out your crystal ball. Um, put on your prognosticator hat and talk to us about just where do you think this industry is going in the next five, 10 years? You know, what do you think the trend lines look like? And, and you know, where are you making bets for XML as the industry changes? That's a great question. It's funny. I was just quoted an article on crypto this morning. You know, so I guess I'll, I'll answer long winded because you, you threw a couple different topics there. I think you have as much as you have an aging baby boom population, you also have an aging advisor population. And so I think you're going to still see consolidation with a lot of M&A activity. I think my crystal ball, and you're already seeing it, is the big banks and wirehouses are not recruiting the same way that they were in the past. They realize that it's just money in and money out. So if they could do things to keep the existing people there, it seems, right, I'm, again, I'm not in those meetings, that that is a smarter strategy for them. But then there's a lot of people that don't want right to be in that big bank brokerage firm model and want to either do it on their own or join firms. And so I think you're going to see a lot of individual RAAs or IBD firms start to merge in with others for succession plan. I think it's going to continue. I think there's going to be a little bit more of a shift towards growth because think about it. If you keep buying an asset at a higher interest rate value where we are today than we were a few years ago, as you brought up you know, earlier in the conversation, 
and that advisor is aging and their book is aging, well, we can just do simple math to figure out when that investment wasn't good. So I think that people that are growing their businesses will be rewarded more when they do M&A strategy. So I just think that's a trend we're going to see. You know, I think the last major, I don't want to call it disruptor, but change in the industry was kind of the mutual fund and ETF. Robos are here. They haven't changed the industry, right? Crypto's here. It's not going to change. In my opinion, it's not going to change the industry. These are things that are out there. But I do think that advisors still provide a tremendous amount of value. There's been a many studies, and, and don't quote me because I don't have all the data, but John Bogle, I think, was quoted, I mean, the founder of Vanguard has said that a good advisor is worth an excess of 3%, right? So the, the inexpensive founder has said that a good advisor is worth as much as 3%. So for people that are charging 1% or, or less, depending on the size, it's a deal. Fidelity to the study, and again, I don't have the exact quotes that they found that the younger generations below, you know, baby boomers actually want to pay because they have FOMO. They're afraid that while they might do things on their own and maybe something through Robinhood or GameStop, or maybe they got lucky on crypto, whatever it may be, they don't want to miss out on something. So firms like ours need to have the technology. They need to have marketing, which if you want, we can talk about that. Um, they need to have things in place that a younger generation of a client can get involved. They can get on a mobile app at two in the morning and see their account. Things that that generation wants, I think, are really important. How they communicate, and we can talk about that. I think that's something we've invested a lot of money into. So I think that there's going to be shifts in the industry. But if your firm is not willing to invest in the people, the technology, the compliance, and the marketing, you're going to have trouble capturing some of those things. A, men, a little bit of mentor of mine, a, a fellow firm, said, Brett, you know, moving the Titanic was very hard and we saw what happened. Do all the things you can do while you're still nimble enough with technology and marketing and compliance, because you're going to get to a point where when you want to do something, it is much harder and slower to do. And so I took that to heart and will invest in those things, people and everything to do it while I, while we're nearing, you know, 4 billion in, in client assets um, that we oversee. And I say client assets because of our affiliated broker dealer. I'm still nimble enough that I can make significant changes and we want to keep going down that path. That is a well thought out answer. One of the things that stuck out to me in what you said was the M&A planning. I actually could not agree more. I, I feel like that's something a lot of people want to do, which is, hey, how do I build relationships with business owners while they're doing it and they're going through it? You know, and then I try to position myself to be an advisor for them, you know, and when they have this liquidity event, then obviously there's a lot of work to be done. But I think on the other side of the table, something I've heard from from friends who own businesses or things is, you know, how do I know if this advisor, you know, sort of has the the right toolbox to help me walk through a liquidity event, right? I know that they can do asset allocation. I know they can help me with certain planning and whatever. Do you think that there's a way to uh, differentiate or highlight that you are a well-trained sort of M and A guide through this process, or you know, is the person just getting, hey, yeah, I'll introduce you to some lawyers or whatever, but I'll be here once all of that you know kind of gets through. Because look, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. There's there's pre-tax planning, there's you know trust planning, there's all kinds of things that if you can have set up before the liquidity event, it can have an incredibly meaningful difference on the yeah. back end. Um, and I guess you know my question is you know. Not all advisors are created equal in that sort of realm, um, but how does a business owner identify whether the person they're talking to across the table is actually good at these things or not? Yeah, I think you need to know what you know and know what you don't know. So I take a firm of ours with you know 25 plus servicing advisors. Really only a handful of us have been through m and I have, right? I have a private equity partner. I have acquired firms. Most of us, my standard advisors have not, and that's okay. But when they're meeting with a prospective client or an existing client, they have the ability to say, let me bring one of my partners in who has been through this. So that is a unique experience that we can bring. But it's also putting the piece of the puzzle together. Sometimes they already have advisors. So you're just a piece of that puzzle. But sometimes they don't know what they don't know. So your job is to say, can I find the attorney? Can I find the business broker? Can I find this? And at the end of the day, if you're going to get paid to manage their liquidity event, you're doing a lot of pro bono work up front to help that other team come into place. I think where people get in trouble is when they really don't know what they're talking about. 
it's okay to say that's not something I focus on, but let me bring someone else who is, who is whether it's within the firm or other strategic advisors. One thing I think we're good at is, you know, when we work with clients is knowing the sandbox that we play best in. I don't work with athletes. Doesn't mean I never would, but if I was going to, I either need to acquire a firm that specializes in this or advisors that specialize in it. Oh, it's sexy. They're athletes. I've had some in the past and it's a, it's a different way of interacting with, with a client. So if I know that, then why am I going to go out there when someone refers me an athlete? Oh, I'm the best and I can help them. I can't, but I can partner with someone who is. And I think people have to get, have a little humility and get over their egos and say, what is what's right for my firm? So I don't put my firm at risk. And what is right for the client? So the client has the best experience. Okay, that's really good. And then what pops into my head there, uh, I know there's actually quite a few young folks who listen to this who might either just be getting into their career or something like that. Let's say that they're like, hey, I want to specialize in working with athletes or I want to specialize in doing M&A you know, stuff. Like, I want to work on getting that specialization you're talking about. So when I get referred that person, how, to, so how would you recommend to somebody younger than that? Like, how do they pour into that? Because, you know, a lot of times a business owner is not going to work with a you know, brand new kid and say, Hey, I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm going to sell my business and give you all my money. So how do you, how do you bridge that gap? How do you build a specialization, you know, while still kind of learning the ropes and, and, and getting your feet under you? Yeah, look, it takes time, right? I mean, it certainly takes time to do it. I mean, when I started, I had my, when I was at Merrill, I had suits, right? We had to wear suits and inside I had my name stitched in it. And I, instead of using a big pen, I would never walk into a meeting with a disposable pen. I had a starter mop blanc pen. And so when I walked in and I opened my jacket, and the prospects like, ooh, custom made suit. It wasn't custom made. I just labeled my name, and I took out a Mont Blanc pen. He, look, yes, he looks twenty two because I was, but he must be successful because he has a custom made suit. So there's a little bit of fake it till you make it. But studies have shown that teams do better than an individual. And so if you want to specialize in something like that, whether it's athletes, whether it's celebrities, M and A, whatever it may be, you're not going to be able to go at it on your own. So either you're going to get lucky and stumble on a deal. And you're going to parlay that deal right into others or join a firm that has experience so you can learn and grow with it. That's a selling point of the big banks and brokerage firms. You go get the whale. We have all these people we can bring in. And that's great. And, and if that's what you need, then you should be at a firm like that. But there's many boutique firms. When I say boutique, they can have 10, 20, 30 billion dollars that are family office groups. They have an athlete division. So if you're the person who might have a little bit of that network, would you be better off starting on your own at a major bank or wirehouse or starting at a boutique firm where they already have the specialty and you might grow into a partner there, but you're going to get the ability to help those. So I think the younger person needs to really look at that and say, where do I, where do I belong? And look, that comes into when we hire talent. I mean, I see a very vast difference in, in the age of the talent, what they're looking for versus when I'm recruiting a more seasoned advisor. There's differences. The pandemic has changed it. People have different you know, morals and values. I talk at some different business schools and some other internship classes and, and you see vast differences. And I give advice, you know, we've been fortunate to hire some younger talent for some, some big firms. I won't mention them because I don't want to bash them, but culturally, they're in the paper every day, um, culturally, they're not great. And um, when I hired this particular individual, I said to him, are you going to be able to leave that firm? I mean, it is the firm of firms to be at. And he said, it's been great. I think there's no clear path for my advancement. I think that the culture is not something that aligns with me. I believe in you and the vision of what you're doing. And I think you will help my career get to the next level. And, and I have a mantra that I live by. Every person that comes to XML, I want you to retire here. And if I'm doing my job as a, as a leader, you should be able to grow personally, professionally, and financially. I really believe it. And so I said to this person, are you going to be able to wake up tomorrow and say, I now work at XML Financial Group versus that firm? And he's like, I don't give a crap. And a year and a half later, he thanks me every day. It's just the best decision I ever made. So when someone's looking at that, I know it's a long-winded answer. There are morals and values and things you have to look at that are going to help you have the quality of life, the balance you want, but grow the type of career that you want. Fantastic. Uh, I love that. All right. So shifting gears a little bit, I uh, want to learn a little bit more about Brent behind Wealth Management. So talk to me about So What Else. You've been involved with them for a little over a decade. I think my note said 12 years yep. uh, involved. 
Tell us about what the organization does. Tell us about what drew you to that and why you wanted to be involved. Two of my good friends actually were co-founders. I was the co-founding board member. One of my buddies got divorced and he always had a joke that his ex-in-laws would always get together. So what else? Like, you know, in a conversation. And what they realized was that when it started, there was a lack of volunteers out there. And so it became like, well, so what else can we do for you? And so what they would do is they would start mobilizing volunteers, get rid of the red tape of big organizations and start to help. And they quickly realized that there was a need with at-risk youth in generally the area that we're in, we'll call it the, the Washington metropolitan DMV area, middle school, elementary schools. And so what they would do is they started providing after-school programs and summer programs, and it started to take off where these kids now had a place to go and a place where they could learn, not just play sports, but they would have people talk about entrepreneurship, right? Things that they maybe didn't have exposure to. And it started to grow rapidly. Then the pandemic hit. It was probably the single greatest thing that happened to the organization because a lot of those programs had to cease right early on in the pandemic. And they became one of the largest food recovery programs in this region, serving millions and millions of food. As we came out of the pandemic, the programs continued to ramp back up, but the charity more than quadrupled in size with food recovery and pantries where people come up daily and can get fresh food and, and clothes and other things. And so it truly is a grassroots organization where many of us are involved in organizations and they're amazing. And I'll never forget my first one I walked into and I was asked to go on the board and there were like 92 board members. And I'm like, they don't give a crap what I have to say. They're doing great work. They want my money. But I didn't feel like I was making a difference. And so when my buddy and, and his friend founded this and said, Brett, we want you to come on as, as a co-founding board member. I said, yeah, because we can take down the red tape and just do good things. And that's how it started over 12 years ago. And, and it's morphed into this amazing organization. That's incredible. I, I'd love to chat with you maybe even a little bit offline. I'm involved with a, a food related nonprofit as well. Kind of a, you know, really similar story. And it, it'd be cool to see if there's any any synergy there. Absolutely. Love hearing about that. We are going to pivot to the final segment of the show, uh, which we call the Mile Marker Minute. It's a kind of a lightning round series of questions, fun in nature. The goal is to have all of the questions answered in less than a minute. Uh, I'm not going to hold you to it, but, you know, punchy lightning round questions that we like to finalize this thing, end with some energy, and then we'll wrap this up. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Okay, awesome. Here we go. Uh, first question for you. Where is one place that you would love to travel that you have never traveled to before? Japan, and I'm booking it right now. Are you really? Yeah. That's excellent. Uh, fantastic. I, I got to follow up really quick. Why Japan? Always love Asian culture, and uh, my daughters are old enough now where I think they can enjoy it, and we've been looking at, um, I won Vietnam for a lot of history. Um, I think the time of year might be a little hot. My family doesn't love the heat, so we think the, Japan might be a great place to, to really dig into that culture. Incredible. Uh, you are a Washington football team, commanders, whatever you want to call them. Redskins. Who are you hoping to see uh, them take in the NFL draft? I mean, I, I, as much as I think that Hal's done a great job, I mean, if you have a potential franchise quarterback, you need to take a quarterback. How that's going to play out could be interesting with the coaching changes and picks. But I think with the ownership um, and if they do take uh, Ben Johnson, which looks like maybe that'll be our coach, an offensive minded coach. A, a potential quarterback would make sense to me. Okay. What is the best thing about living in the greater DC area? The diversity that we have, and there's always something for everyone here, whether it's a museum, new restaurant opening up. I mean, new Greek restaurant opened up. You can't get in DJ banging music till two in the morning, but at the same time, it's such a conservative town with all the politics we have. So I love the diversity and the culture that we have in this whole region. Awesome. Last question. Uh, I know that you uh, spend some of your time volunteering, helping out with, uh, I think it's the Bullis Schools Shark Tank competitions, yep. right? I think I have that right. Yep. What is the best pitch you've heard from a kid's Shark Tank competition? <laughs> best pitch I've heard. I've heard a lot of really interesting ones. One uh, called OTG, uh, like on the go, was a baby yep. diaper bag. And it actually did get a patent and move forward and took the money. Basically, it was a diaper bag could be for men or women, but you know, a lot of times the bags are designed for for uh, for women. And it was one where the changing pad was built inside. So oh, instead nice. of putting the dirty changing pad on something, the bag opened up. So the exterior of the bag touched dirt, the kid touched the inside, and then it closed back up. 
they took the funding, they grew. Um, so that was, that was really exciting. And it's interesting, the team was predominantly males and they're high school kids who hadn't had kids. So it was fascinating that that was the product that they came up with. But there's some really, really interesting ones that come out of that, that out of that school. Incredible. Uh, Brett, those are great answers to the Mile Marker Minute. Uh, I'm very, very thankful you carved out time to come and spend some time with us uh, here on The Connected Advisor. Thanks for sharing your time and your insight. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, everybody. This has been another episode of The Connected Advisor. Thanks so much for following along. Please uh, subscribe or follow on any of the platforms where you listen to podcasts, and we'll catch you on the next episode.